We are uh, obviously here to speak about the DSA. Uh, this is something that is uh, become a, a very common topic of discussion in my inbox with my clients. Uh, I am based in Los Angeles. We represent uh, clients throughout many countries, but certainly within all 50 states of America. Uh, my name is Ryan Morrison. I am the founding partner of Morrison Cooper. Uh, it's a law firm dedicated to digital entertainment, technology, and all the, the nerdy stuff, as we like to, to call it. Uh, and and uh, Antonia, do you want to introduce yourself a bit? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Antonia. I'm based in the Hamburg office of Hogan Levels. I also do a lot of the nerdy stuff for the EU side, um, do a lot of online enforcement, but also co-head our gaming and esports practice and do things like content moderation, um, online compliance for marketplaces, app stores, gaming sites, you name it. So um, in, in essence, um, all the platforms that are captured by the DSA. And yeah, we thought we'd team up um, to give you this hot seat about the topics that people are asking each other around the globe at this moment. Yes, and, and as usual, Antonia is very modest. She is certainly, uh, I've spoken to a lot of attorneys about this. I've spoken to a lot of people in the industry about the DSA generally and the, the DMA, DMA and other uh, similar acts. And I can assure you that she is uh, the foremost expert on this. And uh, it'll be interesting to kind of pick her brain and pull apart parts of this because it affects more companies than I think people realize right now. Um, but to get to the, the meat of it, together with the sister regulation, the, the DMA, the Digital Markets Act, uh, the DSA is one of the most ambitious reform practice packages uh, we've seen in the regulation of all types of online intermediary businesses. It requires a significant compliance lift by intermediaries doing business in Europe. So it doesn't matter if you're in Europe, but if you're doing business there, this is going to affect you and your, your business plans over coming years. Uh, it becomes applicable on the 25th of August. Uh, however, the, that's for the, the 19 big tech companies that are listed there. For everyone else, we're looking at February of 2024, which, uh, you know, I know there's a lot of attorneys in the audience. That's tomorrow. Uh, so February next year is something that we should be thinking about, of course, today and yesterday and, and everything before. Uh, and the, the purpose of today is to arm you with knowledge to understand not only what this is and how it affects you, but also as in-house counsel or people that are advising these companies to be armed with the knowledge to go to your team and express to them why this is important and why to take it seriously. Uh, so Antonio, let's start up top. Who should be most concerned about the DSA? Yeah, sure. Um, essentially, it's a horizontal regulation, which means that it has very general rules that are applicable to all types of online intermediaries. So all online services that are engaged either in conduit, caching, or hosting of third-party content. So the third-party content element is uh, the quintessential core of the DSA. Um, however, the widest set of obligations under the DSA applies to online platforms. And online platforms are all services which not only host third-party content, but then also make it accessible to the general public. For example, your typical social media site, gaming and metaverse platforms, um, to the extent, of course, that they include user-generated content, online marketplaces, app stores, booking sites, and so on. And among, among all these online platforms, there's then a very small subset of big tech companies, which reach over 45 million average users um, a monthly in the EU, and which are being designated by the European Commission as so-called very large online platforms, or VLOPs, how we call them in a not very pretty name. Um, and the first round of these designations has already happened in April. And 19 big tech companies um, and two, um, two search engines will have to comply with a very extensive set of VLOP obligations under the DSA, as you said, from 25th August onwards. Yeah, and that's, again, that is almost literally tomorrow, but then there's going to be uh, February next year for, for the rest. Uh, 
So looking at this more closely, how, do, how does the DSA affect the obligation of businesses who are not within Europe or, or the EU at large, uh, but whose customers are located within? Yeah, so the DSA really doesn't care where you are based. Um, it is very egalitarian. Uh, <laughs> it will apply to any company that does business in Europe and is targeting EU users to a relevant extent, but that threshold of targeting is pretty low. So um, in a nutshell, the mere accessibility of a service in Europe would not necessarily suffice for it to apply. But if there's an additional element of, um, I don't know, you display your website in multiple languages or have a built-in Google Translate function, you show your prices in euro, of course, if you, um, if you indicate that you ship to Europe, uh, indicators like that um, will very quickly and easily pull you within the DSA's range of applicability. And that's something that many companies do and might not even realize just using third party vendors or whatever that their prices are automatically shown in euros or it, it's advertising. So th this is a much broader net than I think many uh, people realize. It's it's very similar to the, the uh, uh, GDPR when that came out and people said, ah, I'm not really doing that much business in Europe, but it it's, turns out it doesn't really matter. Uh, if you're there, you're there. So if you are outside of Europe, let's say I'm, I'm a Japanese or Hong Kong company, who will be my regulator in those instances? Yeah, that's a really good question. So if you're based outside of the EU um, and have no establishment whatsoever within it, um, then you would need to designate a so-called legal representative um, in a member state of your choice. So basically, you can go forum shopping. Um, and the newly formed DSA authority of that country, which will be called the Digital Service Coordinator, will have the primary oversight and enforcement powers over you. So in essence, this forum shopping, this choice of the location of your future legal representative is a really important strategic decision that you should carefully consider because... Um, of course, the member states historically have a very different attitude um, and also resources, of course, in terms of manpower and budget um, of enforcement measures. So it makes a big difference if you go to the Netherlands or to Cyprus or to Lithuania or to Ireland. Never go to Germany. <laughs> 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 or to France. <laughs> that's not uh, that's not recommended. <laughs> I, I mean, are you comfortable expanding on why, or should we leave that alone? <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, France has basically spearheaded the DSA effort very strongly, and as um, we are witnessing France to enforce very aggressively on all fronts um, um, in the online um, services space. And and Germany is a close second, probably. No. Yeah, and, and France in particular has come out with a lot of ancillary legislation and and guidelines that uh, definitely are more more constrictive for sure. Um, so which is the right country? No, I'm kidding. I won't make you choose a country. Uh, it's gonna, and that will also of <laughs> that's course, more hard. That's harder to. It's always easier to point the finger than to say something constructive. <laughs> that's right, and it, it, it will. It'll be different depending on where you do business and how you do business and a, a bunch of other things. But uh, but you you named some of the countries that are probably going to be the top picks uh, for sure. Now that said, when you are going to pick someone and you're trying to figure out the right match and you're looking at that side of it, the other important side of it is what are the requirements that the EU representative has to meet? Yeah, so um, your legal representative can be any natural person or also entity that resides in the EU. So you would have to provide this legal representative with all the necessary powers and resources. Um, in order to guarantee efficient cooperation with the competent authorities and compliance with their decisions. And what you also should bear in mind is that the legal representative can actually be held liable side by side with the intermediary operator itself for any form of non-compliance with the DSA. So typically that's why we recommend to clients that they 
set up an entity or instruct an entity um, rather than an actual person for the liability um, aspects. And I also should have mentioned, we're already getting really good questions in uh, from the participants in the chat, but if anybody does have any questions throughout this process or, or has anything that they want to hear either one of us uh, pull apart a bit more, feel free to put that in the, the chat on Zoom. And uh, uh, not all of you can see it, I don't think, but we can see it and we'll make sure we address it and, and answer it uh, towards the end or, or immediately if it's super relevant. Uh, so let's, let's take a, a, a look at kind of a one of the weird use cases because there's a lot of those kind of examples and everything else um but but let's say you're you know you're on that that line of doing business or not doing business and one of your your main things is you really only have user reviews uh on your online shop does that make you an online platform under these rules so you have a online shop that only sells you're the merchant of record for that online shop there's no third party selling okay right um yeah no that that's a really good and important question and the answer i don't want to be boring and give the predictable <laughs> lawyer answer it depends <laughs> but um <laughs> let's go with probably not um so strictly speaking, of course, user reviews are user content, i.e. third party content that is disseminated to the wider public on your first party um, proprietary online shop. But there's an exception under the DSA under which a service does not qualify as an online platform is if the dissemination of third party content is only a minor and ancillary feature. Um, so in, in, in this scenario, I would probably go with minor and ancillary. Um, but of course that's also debatable because which offer I go for on, on an online shop may very strongly depend on what users say about it. So you could say user reviews are really important drivers of your business. And um, there's a good reason why there's so many scammers out there selling fake uh, positive reviews um, because they are really important for your decision making. Um, but until further notice, my personal um, my personal take is that user reviews are uh, minor and ancillary, and therefore a one-party online shop would not become an online platform merely by virtue of them. Um, but bear in mind that you are still hosting those reviews, and right. therefore the DSA still applies to you, just not with the wider set of online platform obligations, but with the smaller subset of hosting provider obligations. And which, that is the part that I'm finding most clients not... Yeah understanding the difference that just because you're not hit with these wider array of of guidelines doesn't mean that none of it applies to you yeah precisely so hosting providers have to comply with with all the content moderation obligations um in, in particular so that's that's very important to bear in mind absolutely um so something i deal with literally every single day is the dmca and the dmca is you know, the bread and butter of brand protection, even if you're outside of America, even though it's an American piece of legislation, it's something that most platforms have utilized as, okay, this is one of the strictest forms of copyright enforcement. We're going to have a web form that that allows users to send in notice and we will act and issue the takedowns or issue the conversations or whatever is required. Um, so the DSA introduces, introduces new uh, harmonized notice and takedown obligations. It, it certainly broadens that out. Um, are these comparable to, to the DMCA? And, and the reason I ask that is because so many websites already have a DMCA form. Is, is this going to be similar? Uh, to some extent, yes. Uh, but the DSA goes much further than the DMCA. And of course, you're the expert on the DMCA and I'm not. But um, from how I see them side by side, um, the DSA covers all forms of illegal content, not just infringements of IP rights, with, uh, which are at the core of the DMCA obligations. Um, and so any kind of illegality of content, either under EU harmonized law or under the law of any member state, so any national law in the EU, can 
in the future be reported under the DSA. So it, it really goes much further than the DMCA. It then is similar again in terms of how it structures the safe harbor uh, regime and um, avoiding liability. Mm, um, but it also goes further in that it prescribes um, extremely detailed steps of what users have to put in their notice form um, when they report something and also um, the mechanisms how then the platforms or the hosting providers have to interact with the notifier and the content uploader um, and provides appeal mechanisms and so on. So really extremely um, detailed and therefore also extremely um, burdensome for, for your compliance lift. And this is going to be the nightmare element, in my opinion, just to go on a brief tangent. Uh, we see the DMCA abused every day by people that don't have a legitimate copyright claim, but they file one anyway to get competitors' work shut down or get reviews removed that they don't like or, or whatever it might be. Um, so the fact that this is so broad is something that genuinely terrifies me, but that's why I... I call you. I need help in Europe. So, <laughs> uh, but that that is that is interesting because I am uh, a copyright nerd and an intellectual property nerd. Uh, who can file notice for IP violations under the DSA? For, you know, forgetting the broader everything's illegal element, you can report everything. Speaking of IP, which I expect to be most of the the reports, who who can file those? Does it have to be the rights holder? Yeah, um, that's what you would expect. And that's, of course, how it is handled everywhere that you have to demonstrate that you either own the rights that um, you are um, reporting an infringement of or you are the licensor, uh, the licensee, sorry. Um, but under the DSA's language and logic, anyone can file a notice for anything and that also at first sight includes IP violations. So as you said, um, you can really imagine how this would result in a large amount of ill-informed and really unsubstantiated notices, which will create some huge backlog potentially for the big online platforms for sure. So what, what we usually recommend is that um, clients maintain a separate track for IP related notices and make special rules for the intake of those. And there are several options how to shape such a differential intake channel appropriately um, while still complying with the spirit of the DSA, which um, on paper says that you have to treat everyone reporting anything in the same way. Which is hard to internalize. Uh, <laughs> All you need to do is go to the YouTube comment section on any video on YouTube and you'll see that most of the internet is bad people. Uh, and, and jokes aside, I mean, we get so many frivolous reports of people pretending yeah. to be the rights holders. Yeah. I can't imagine when they're able to do it on behalf of, of anyone for anything. Yeah, I know. Which is why it's so important that you make them jump through hoops. So make your intake form as detailed and complex and complicated as possible and make it compulsory to fill in all the blank spaces um, for, for being able to submit the form. Um, and then some of them may lose interest. Um, yes, and make sure well, to use a CAPTCHA so you're not getting chat GPT yeah. filing 10,000 an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and also, I mean, even those who file in good faith, they will need guidance to give you all the information that you need to make an informed decision and not to waste your internal resources trying to guesstimate what what content they refer to or which law they refer to. And and um, I mean, the DSA does not obligate you to do any investigations of your own. So you could just push back and say, well, we don't understand this notice and we don't see the illegality um, substantiated sufficiently. But of course, that also binds resources. And so um, it's in everyone's best interest if you really think very carefully about your notice intake form. And, and does that uh invest let's call it an investigation does that because with the dmca for example you don't get to do an investigation if you get a report you have to take the content down 
mm. uh, to, to maintain your safe harbor liability. Is the DSA similar with that or can you kind of make a judgment call? No, you have to. You have to assess, but the notice has to give you everything to make your assessment so easy that it's a prima facie case of infringement. Um, but it's not an automatism in the sense that, oh, I received a notice for this kind type of content. I can see which content this uh, relates to. I'm just taking it down. You have to, um, if it doesn't seem substantiated to you, then you have to push back. There is some symbolism there, I think, that Europe requires you to assess and use your brain and America does not allow <laughs> you to use your brain. Uh, <laughs> uh, but moving on from that, I am a, I'm a proud patriot, obviously. <laughs> That's a obviously. deep rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, but with respect to liability for the third party content that, that we're typically going to be discussing here, is actual knowledge required? Yeah, there's no constructive knowledge element. So it's not like you should have known, you could have known, you might have known. You only have to act on a notice that is so well substantiated um, that the intermediary can assess the illegality without any detailed examination. And there's also no um, constructive element in the sense that you were maybe negligently closing your eyes to some truth that you should have realized. Yeah, the bandwidth you're expending on this should be time, less actual investigations and, and resources on that end. So that, that makes total sense. Um, just to cap off the, the topic, because we're talking about people maybe filing these uh, without the proper knowledge or without even the right intent, are minors allowed to file notices under the DSA? Yeah, that's an interesting one because the DSA doesn't really say, like it doesn't for a lot of things. <laughs> um, my take is that for services which allow minors to be among their user base, typically 13 plus, these users should also be given the right to file notices. And of course you can require parental consent um, for them to do that um, and build that in as a guardrail um, to make sure that, that they are really serious about filing a notice and not just doing it as an act of revenge against some someone from their school who has annoyed them um, because they won at Fortnite or whatever. So, um, yeah, I mean, Fortnite was last year. It's the year of Roblox. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds that sounds silly. But of course, there are a lot of platforms where this behavior between minors does happen a lot where they just um, try to um, to have a little competition of their own with obstructing each other and with their UGC. Um, so yeah, build in guardrails, but if you do target minor users or allow minor users, then um, you should also open up the notice intake channel for them. And also keep in mind, uh, you know, many of the people in the audience I know work with companies or, or advise companies that don't necessarily admit externally that their user base is younger because of privacy laws and things like that. And that's fine. The mixed audience argument is an important one. When it comes to this, though, I think it's important to, to internalize what Antonia is saying, that even though you might not have a vast younger user base, if you have a, a legitimate one, it's worth allowing them to take part in this process. It's just going to require the, the same kind of vetting that uh, you know, you're not used to with these other things. Um, speaking of minors, platforms are required to take a lot of measures to protect minors, like those privacy laws I'm, I'm talking about. Uh, what, are the, some, what are some of the things that platforms might have to consider or do now uh, for minors? Yeah, so the DSA itself does not have a strong focus on minors. It has some general language of ensuring that online services um, implement a high level of protection, provide a safe environment for minors. And then those services which are predominantly used by minors or target minors also have the obligation to write their terms and conditions in a way which minors can easily understand. And then 
also any kind of profiling and targeted advertising to minors is prohibited on online platforms. Um, yeah, with, so that applies to the smaller subset of online platforms. And that's a but big of course, change. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, that's a big one for the online platforms, but there are other laws in the EU which have a stronger focus on the protection of minors, such as the Audiovisual Media Services Directive, the AVMSD. And if your service does have a solid underage user base, then you will already be providing them with a safe environment, setting up robust community guidelines in terms of use, prohibiting any type of grooming, of course, activities, actioning with high priority, any notices that are related to content affecting minors, in particular CSAM, of course, and by implementing parental controls and consent mechanisms. And I expect a lot of companies to come out and help through this process for, for companies that are targeted or work with minors, similarly to how we saw with privacy and everything else that you needed a little bit extra help with, because this shouldn't become your new company's entire pool of resources focusing on how to deal with your minor user base. User base. There's going to be other ways to do that. Uh, but but that that's super helpful. Thank you. Um, moving to advertising, which is obviously another big part of the the pie here. Um, with with respect to online ad transparency, advertisers may want to make this disclosure as uh, let's call it hidden as possible. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, they they want to get away with. Yes, we were compliant. Yes, we put it out there, but hide it in a corner, make it a quick pop up that disappears, blah, blah, blah. What are the actual requirements that businesses should keep in mind when advertising to uh, residents of the European U European the EU? <laughs> it's midnight leave me alone <laughs> ah, but you just were warming up it's that's right I hour. almost got it out. <laughs> oh yeah no advertising also is is a minefield for sure so um because of course advertising you want to get in people's faces with your ad and you <laughs> That's the whole point of it. So first of all, um, let's remember that the e-commerce directive, which has been in place for these 20 plus years, already has an existing obligation requiring that all commercial communications, which also includes commercial forms of advertising, promotions, games, discounts, must be clearly identifiable as such. So the DSA doesn't really introduce anything new where it comes to the requirement to clearly mark such content. And so I fear there aren't really any loopholes here because it's been a tested and established system. But there are two things that are new now under the DSA. First, um, it distinguishes between commercial communications on the one hand and advertising on the other. And Commercial communications, as the DSA defines them, refer to promotional content that is uploaded by users directly, like your typical influencer content. Um, Which is typically may... advertisements, and they're just separating it for yeah. some unknown reason. <laughs> yeah, well, no, it, it makes it, it makes sense. Um, because the DSA is focused on third-party content and given that as a matter of principle, service providers are not responsible for checking the third-party content, there's the Good Samaritan rule under the DSA, which was also there under the e-commerce directive, which says that um, you don't have to do proactive monitoring and you are not um, penalized if you do it voluntarily. So you are not responsible for monitoring everything. So you may not be aware that someone is advertising in their personal posts. Mm, therefore, with regard to those, all the providers have to do is to provide the users with an appropriate functionality to identify the commercial communications themselves. And only if and once a user has done so and has identified a post as containing commercial communication, 
um, then will the service provider in a second step have to ensure that the content is appropriately marked. And then, so that's the first um, difference, commercial communications versus advertising. And secondly, the other difference, the DSA has a definition of advertising that is very broad and it also covers non-commercial promotions of a message. And of course, this was included to aim at capturing all forms of political advertising in particular after the um, debacles around um, influencing votes um, on social media. So the advertising obligations relate to promotions, commercial or non-commercial, promotion of a message for which the service provider itself has received payment and therefore, of course, knows about the existence of this promotion, of this advertisement. In consequence here for this advertising content for which it has received payment, the service provider itself is responsible for ensuring that all advertisements are identified and marked as such. And keep in and mind, then, this is, oh, sorry, yeah. No, 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 um, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that this is coming out similarly to a, a lot of other, not even legislation, but new guidelines and recommendations from, from various nations across the globe. And we're watching a lot of companies that are not even necessarily on this list of, of uh, blocks uh, that, that are on there. And instead, it's it's uh, we're seeing every single day new advertising guidelines, new rules of what you can and cannot post and promoted content. We saw Twitch just to, this morning in, in America uh, launch new guidelines on what they're going to allow with advertising, and they were the 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 public went crazy over it. So walking this line of doing everything you're recommending and watching this be done the right way while also keeping in mind you do have a user base and you do have to keep communications clear and concise and make this all make sense. This is allowed to be confusing for us and the everyone in the <laughs> audience. It's not allowed to be confusing to your users. And that's, I think that yeah. gets lost here yeah. sometimes. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. And of course, where it then, um, because you mentioned Twitch, um, I'm thinking of and I don't think there's anyone from Twitch in the audience, so you can be <laughs> honest. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you mentioning Twitch makes me think of gaming platforms and environments in particular. And there, um, often it will become even more complex to mark commercial content and advertising in an appropriate way that doesn't really obstruct the user experience because um, you will typically have a moving three-dimensional environment um, um, in the gaming and metaverse con context. And um, one thing is very clear, the DSA um, lawmakers had no concept of this application at all or could not wrap their heads around it if they were thinking about it. Um, it, it will be really challenging um, for for game and metaverse platform operators in particular to to implement that obligation in a way that is not totally hideous. That's the trick that it's 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 designing this in a way that is compliant and makes it clear that you know the user uploading it can click a button and say this is sponsored content without uh, making this ugly or make it look you know the the I work with a ton of brands and a ton of creators and influencers, and the, the only thing they care about is making advertisements look organic or natural or smooth, and you're just not allowed to under this. And I think that's okay. I think that's the intent, is that they're not you're not supposed to be tricking your audience into thinking you really love McDonald's if you've never eaten it. Uh, but you know the, the reality is it's going to be a give and take with the legal team and the product team and the marketing team all coming together and making something that is compliant, but works. And that that's where yeah. this dance will happen. Um, I have a, a lot of questions left. I could talk to you for forever about this, but I also um, just gonna start pulling in some audience questions because we have some good ones. Uh, so one of them is uh, talking about this topic and that's why I wanna jump on it. Classifying content that originally is from a third party. However, it's been editorialized or edited by, by the platform itself. Is that something that you would say is affected as, as advertising or under the other category with the DSA? 
So, um, and I can post it for you. Part of it is in German. I don't yeah. know if that helps. Um, that's <laughs> that's very interesting because that opens up a total Pandora's box. Um, so the third party content does remain third party content in this in this scenario. So a user has uploaded it um, on its own initiative and then pre-upload the, as I understand the question, the platform makes some editorial changes to it, um, which of course, just think of a marketplace and someone uploads an offer and maybe you enrich the third party offer on the marketplace by additional keywords. Um, or change the title to make it a more appropriate for the users to find it on your internal search engine. Um, in that situation, depending on the nature of the changes that um, the platform operator has made, it may be that the platform loses the hosting privilege. So it would still remain third party content um, with all the DSA obligations still applying. And then on top of it, the only one saving grace that the DSA brings you as a platform operator, which is that you have the liability safe harbor and are not liable for any illegality of the third party content goes away. Um, if you make changes that go beyond mere um, organizational changes, such as restructuring the content or um, sorting it on your website um, and actually makes content related material changes, then you would lose, um, you would forfeit the hosting privilege and um, be seen as taking what is called an active role under the um, CGEU case law on this uh, already existing under the e-commerce directive. So it's it's a really important question and a really um, important point to bear in mind that if you do um, interfere with third party content on your um, platform in any way, um, always make sure to toe the line of it not becoming an active role uh, and staying um, on the level of editorial, structural, um, well, I shouldn't use the word editorial, but structural organize, organizational um, um, activities, which which are okay. Yeah, and, and, it, and it, it's true across the board. If you're changing user uploaded content in any way, you should be speaking to a legal team to make sure you're not running afoul of a, a variety of different laws. But that's a great summary. Kind of speaking of that, uh, we have another question, uh, you know, that that uh, speaks to that, which is basically, let's zoom out. There's so much new legislation. There's so much new stuff from the EU, from the rest of the world. The DSA is something that that everyone is talking about, and and I, hopefully everyone is thinking about because it is going to be legitimate. How does it fit into the bigger picture? What is the, you know, forget the legalese of it for a moment. What is the actual intent? What is the, how should people be interacting with the idea of this right now with everything else going on as well? Um, sorry, can you recap that again? Because I was a yeah. bit distracted by another um, user question. That no, 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 it's totally in. fine. But, but just looking at the, yeah, looking at the DSA and all the conversations around it, Thinking of all the new legislation coming down in the EU and the rest of the world and everything else, just kind of, you know, zooming out and looking at this bigger picture, how does the DSA fit into that bigger picture where it's it's not like companies have to worry about the DSA. It's one of many things. So so where does this kind of fit sure. into the grand scheme? Yeah, um, that's an important question because, of course, whatever you do in terms of compliance, you always want to make sure you do it uh, most efficiently and um, in a way that is holistic and also in line with your obligations under other pre-existing regulations or other regulations that are in the drafting and you, you see coming on the horizon. Um, unfortunately, the question of the big picture is something which the 
Brussels legislator, in my opinion, should have asked uh, and answered more clearly itself. Um, we actually spoke to MEPs in Brussels a while back, and they themselves were lamenting that new laws were being churned out really without enough regard to their congruence and um, interplay with the pre-existing ones. So to give you an example, maybe the relationship between the DSA and the P2B, the platform to business regulation is one example of it. Um, and we can go into the P2B DSA relationship Let's do in it. a bit give more a quick, detail. Give a breakdown, because not everyone's familiar with the P2B. So, so give us yeah. a little summary and breakdown of that. Yeah, sure. So the platform to business obligation uh, um, obligations under the P2B regulation apply to the relationship between online platforms and their business users. And since the DSA captures all users, of course, it also includes the business users. And then um, there's some overlap where both regimes, the DSA and the P2B regulation, um, provide for appeal mechanisms, for instance, but do it differently. So now the question is, which regime do I comply with? Um, do I treat my business users differently under the P2B regulation and then everyone else under the DSA? It's not spelled out clearly. In my opinion, the P2B is the more special law which prevails over the DSA where business users are affected. But um, it becomes really tricky because um, the regulator didn't really um, pin it down um, properly. They just said non, notwithstanding and then listed a whole bunch of regulations and directives which um, which do have some overlap with the DSA, including the GDPR, for instance, um, and leaving it pretty much open which of them applies in which given situation. Yeah, uh, it's 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 going to be an evolving conversation because it's it's even the EU taking these different bills or, or legislation into account as they put out new ones. People forget, I think, that are making laws that the internet exists. So most companies are doing business everywhere. And you have to think about everywhere when you're writing in what, you know, these poor companies have to figure out how to be compliant with laws that do not work well together from various regions that they're all in business with. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, it's a key reason that you're such an important part of this conversation because figuring that all out and prioritizing what is what is the real risk here uh, is the hard part. And, and that's what you know we try to break down. Uh, another question from uh, one of the attendees, what is the key difference between uh, conduit and caching services versus hosting services uh, in terms of uh, applic applicability with the DSA? Yeah, sure. So as I mentioned in the beginning, they are all captured. Um, and then you could think of it like an onion. Um, and at the core of it, there's the, the VLOPs, the very large online platforms, and they have the most intense set of obligation. And then it goes out um, in these layers. And the um, largest layer is all intermediaries. So conduit and caching are captured under the intermediary, the 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 smallest, the one on the outset, but the smallest um, set of obligations. Um, in, in, in essence, they only have the obligation to collaborate with authorities, um, name a legal representative in the EU if they don't have an establishment there. So the very basic um, framework to collaboration with the authorities. Um, and of course, to take down um, any illegal content uh, which they are notified of, while the hosting providers, because they host third-party content in a stable way rather than just permanently, uh, um, um, temporarily storing it um, as caching does, for instance, or conduit just passing it through, um, the hosting providers, with their more permanent uh, presence of third-party content have wider obligations, which also include transparency reporting, for example, about all their content moderation efforts each year um, and things like that. 
Oh, that's great. Uh, I, 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 uh, and hopefully that's helpful. Again, we have about 10 minutes left. If anybody has any questions, feel free to add them to the, the queue here. We'll try to get us th through as many as possible. Um, another question that I, you know, I am so intrigued by this and where the line is. Uh, and so I appreciate the follow up. Um, the content, let's say the content is reported by a user. Uh, platform, do platforms have to follow the notice and takedown procedures under the DSA? Or kind of what's the process? Let's say a user reports something, what would you expect the next step to be? Is it compliance? Is it the analysis? Is it, uh, is it, a, is it a, just yes, we'll take it down and we'll deal with it later. Kind of what's the what's the breakdown on your end? At just how the platform reacts to a notice filed by a user. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's and not even how more. What is the obligation? Do we have you know at, at what point? Let's say we're doing an analysis or we say we're yeah. going to look into this. How long do you have? Like what what is the what does the process look like? Sure. So. Um... You have to set up, of course, the intake channel. You have your online form um, where users can report something. Um, then if you're a big platform that receives a lot of those notices um, already now and you expect it to continue um, the same way, um, then you will typically also have a system of triaging, of giving precedence to certain um, types of notices, um, which flag more serious potential infringements such as terrorist content, incitement to violence, CSAM, things like that. And there are, of course, specific rules in place for CSAM and terrorist content that apply on top of the DSA. Um, and in particular, have um, include very short turnaround times. Um, then once you've done your triaging, which will typically be an automated process. Um, you look at your notice and you, you see if you if your content moderation team can confirm um, on the basis of a playbook, which you will presumably have for them, um, that, that there's illegality under some law within the EU, um, then you would take that content down and at the same time inform the uploader as well as the notifier of your decision and you have to give them a reasoned um, decision which has to contain a certain number of elements so that they are both in a situation to um, to assess whether you made the right decision and uh, what their chances of appealing your decision might be. Um, and then the process continues. If one of them is unhappy with, with the outcome, then they can appeal. And they have the choice if they either want to do an internal um, complaint to you um, where you reassess the situation, or they can take it to a mediator, or of course they can go to court if they want it. Um, so there's three, <laughs> yeah, there's always court. Uh, so there's three different appeal channels for that. And um, so it goes on until, um, everyone is happy or there's a final decision with which maybe someone is not happy, but it's final. Um, so it's not like some platforms handle it at the moment where they just say, oh, we've given you notice to the uploader, um, so please sort it out between yourselves. The, the platform has to stay engaged um, and make the decision itself. <clears throat> No, that's great. And so I, I know there's uh, some attendees that are already from the, the very large online platforms uh, at this webinar and the last one that we're already in conversations with. But let's say you're not. Let's say you have till next February, but you, this still applies to you and you have a lot of things that you need to take seriously and, and get started on. Um, what are the most imminent steps that you recommend for someone in the audience right now who has to go back to their team and say, the DSA is real. We need to take this seriously. How do we? Uh, how do we? You know, get rolling here. What are the? What are the next <laughs> most imminent steps uh, for someone yeah. listening in here? Sure. Um, so, I, I was talking about this onion image before. Um, given that there's different categories of service, which are all captured by the DSA, but to a different extent. And sometimes it's not completely 
clear cut whether a service or um, a part of a service falls into one or the other category. The most important first step would be scoping of your services. Is it even a third party content service? And if yes, which of the categories is it? Is it hosting? Is it even an online platform? Is it only caching um, or conduit even, um, which would be pretty obvious. And once you've done that for each distinct part of your services, then um, I would prepare a checklist of all the DSA obligations and where applicable also, of course, corresponding platform to business obligations that apply. And on that basis, do a gap analysis um, and do a triage process for the gaps you have identified. So which of these upcoming obligations have the biggest impact on your business? which obligations will take your tech teams the longest to implement. Um, and, of and lawyers, course, oh. please think about that. <laughs> lawyers yeah. always forget that things actually have to be programmed. <laughs> <laughs> and that programming isn't, isn't wizardry that just happens right. overnight. <laughs> Figure this out by Friday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so which take the longest to implement. Then, of course, also, are there maybe some quick fixes like which implementation measures will be most immediately visible. So if you can prettify, I, I shouldn't give this kind of advice on recording, but if, if, if you can prettify your terms and conditions, for instance, if you know you're running out of time and you, you want to show the world that you're complying and making an effort to comply, then just bring your terms and conditions in order, because of course that's the first place where authorities will go looking, where competitors will go looking for any deficiencies, where consumer protection agencies will go looking. So I think those are the three factors that that are most critical for your triaging um, of and which that last compliance part is so important. efforts. Uh, yeah, yeah. Not not to interrupt, but that last part is so important because we have so many clients who who not even just for this, but for similar laws even. They put so much effort into complying and building out a roadmap and trying to make it work. And they deal with their terms of service and privacy policy and anything else that might be relevant last. That should be first because I've mm -hmm. I've never seen uh, enforcement come in or get started that didn't at least start or or begin with a look at the terms of service and and other existing documents there. So that really should be a top priority and something to think about. It's, that's great advice. Just wanted to yeah. point that out. Thank you. Um, yeah. And we have time for one more question, but the but the question I just asked was, you know, what what should your most imminent steps be with the DSA? And you forgot the most important part, which is call you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but let's let's end it on the question that I know you don't want to answer because uh, no attorney wants to answer this. Uh, <laughs> what do you think the first enforcement measures will look like? Are we looking at company ruining fines or are we uh, looking at slaps <laughs> on the wrist? Oh gosh, yeah. Um if this were better call Saul, then I would probably say, yes, company ruining fines. That's right. <laughs> um, <laughs> you better sign up or you're, you're uh, toast. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so one thing to make most people worry less is that the first enforcement measures will surely be targeted at the very large online platforms, because of course they are the first who must implement from 25th August onwards. Um, and they are already very strongly in the focus of the regulators and the world at large, because they are the obvious ones who have been targeted, who really the legislator had in mind when drafting this. They were thinking about Facebook. Um, and they were and, thinking about- And not about, even the other 18, it, they're thinking about Facebook. <laughs> they were thinking a lot about Facebook. They, um, but they were thinking about the big tech companies. Um, so which of the many obligations then the enforcement will focus on first is hard to predict because it will of course depend on how ready everyone is on 25th August. And from working with um, several of these, they are very ready. <laughs> Um, so 
presumably um, the European Commission, who is the oversight body for the very large online platforms. So they are not regulated by the digital services coordinators in any given member state, but centrally by the European Commission. Um, and the European Commission, of course, is also stretched with, with their resources. They, I mean, the DSA is a behemoth and, and, and they also have to wrap their heads around it. So um, they will go looking um, for any flaws they find with the inf uh, inf um, compliance measures of the very large online platforms. Um, and that gives some comfort to all the others because they can take a sneak preview also of how compliance can look like and can review the terms and conditions um, of the big tech companies and look at their notice intake channels and so on. And then of course, next in line will be the other online platforms that don't rise to the level of VLOP. And since these are regulated at a national level by the digital services coordinators of their individual member state, there the efficiency and the cutting edge, the, the heft of enforcement will depend very strongly and um, on how eager and sophisticated and well-staffed and well-budgeted uh, those local national authorities will be, um, which bring it, bringing it back to our earlier discussion makes it so important to really choose your location wisely if you have the ability to choose um, where to designate um, your legal representative for the DSA. And time will tell, but that's, that's uh, all in line with, I think, reality. However, I'll fill in you're all doomed unless you call Antonia and get this all resolved. So. <laughs> um, but no, in all seriousness, thank you all for, for joining us from, I, I'm, it, it's exciting how all over the world the audience is right now. Uh, so I really do appreciate all of you coming and all of your questions. I know we didn't get through all the questions. Uh, I apologize for that. So please feel free to shoot us an email afterwards yeah, and we'll make sure we get back to you. Um, do you want to share your best contact information? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can find me my my first name has an h in it the antonia which is unusual and then the surname is even more unusual so uh, you will find me on the internet <laughs> google antonia from hogan Lovells, you'll find her and and for us we just went through a rebranding we used to be morrison rothman but as of uh three days ago we're yes morrison Cooper, exciting so. we're it is very exciting so are we witnessing to... your first public appearance as this a speaker is, yes ah. It's uh, the, the, the christening voyage. So appreciate you having me for sure. Um, and again, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, sincere appreciation to, to all of you. And uh, hopefully this was beneficial, but this is complicated, right? So we're, we're both happy to, to always speak. Obviously, uh, this is more an EU piece of legislation. So I would call the EU lawyer. Uh, but if you ever need an American to yell at or yell with, uh, you can always give me a <laughs> ring as well. Yes, please <laughs> ring Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Bye -bye. everybody.